Привет. Yuri also told me to say меня зовут Gregor. So, yeah. Oh, and I forgot. It's it's very cold inside. So that's why. Just. So my name is Gregor. This is the, actually the Christmas edition of myself. <laughs> so yeah, welcome everybody. I'm very very happy to uh, have the possibility to dive a little bit deeper into the TypeScript type system uh, in the next or uh, yeah, a couple of minutes with you. And if you have any question to the talk, feel free to just um, ask me any question that you like. And what I want to present to you today is uh, a feature of TypeScript called condi conditional types. Um, basically, what I really love when it comes to web development is uh, the kind of dynamic world, right? So in JavaScript, we are very free to do pretty much anything. And we can patch a, little, a lot of things, we can compose a lot of things together and make things work. Uh, this is, uh, if you start with JavaScript, really some kind of the fun part. You can get results very, very quickly. But if it comes to enterprise, I think screw a little bit up because JavaScript is not that predictable, right? So. Um, sometimes we do not really know how things work together. We need to yeah, debug uh, just in time if we start our applications. Um, uh, if they run, we need to add some console logs, alerts, and so on, and to see, okay, what has my colleague done uh, before, how things work together. And um, this is somehow, yeah, it becomes a mess. So, yeah, this is. A picture of my Lego box at home. <laughs> so, but then Anders Heilsberg, uh, the founder of uh, TypeScript, uh, somehow he, he recognizes this problem, right? And he came up with a language called TypeScript. And TypeScript was really the beginning of typing the whole web, uh, making uh, JavaScript development more predictable. And uh, he really just gave us tools that are organized, that are structured, and that allows us uh, to build our JavaScript and web applications at scale. And uh, when TypeScript started, um, many, many years before, uh, it actually became very famous in 2016 or 2015 when they started the cooperation with Google. Um, TypeScript was somehow limited to some things. You, was, you wasn't able to type everything. And since TypeScript 2.8 came out, uh, everything is possible to be typed. And this is, comes down to this feature that we call conditional types. And we will learn today what conditional types are and how we can use, how we can use them. So as I said before, my name is, uh, my name is Minyaza Wutrigo Bevude. Yeah, I am the CTO of this little software consultancy in Germany. It's called CoIT, and I work as a speaker, trainer, and developer. Um, I post regularly uh, blog posts on Medium about Angular and TypeScript, and if you have any questions about Angular or TypeScript, you can uh, send me a direct message in, on Twitter if you want to. Um, yeah, so in this May, uh, I became an Angular Google developer expert as well, and I'm really proud to be part of this program. <clears throat> okay, what I also really love is open source. So you can see three open source projects that I maintain. Uh, one of them is Kenton, it's a test data synthesizer. Then there is NGRX Dux. This is uh, NGRX plugin that you can use to save some bo boilerplate. And there is something called CoIT Schematics, a simple tool uh, helping you scale out your Angular projects. And what those projects have in common is that they are all built with TypeScript. And actually, ty uh, NGRX Dux made me diving uh, into conditional types. So the talk that you will see right now is not a theoretical thing. It, was, it, it really came from uh, building NGRX Dux. And if you want to have a look at how conditional types work in a larger library, you can check out NGRX Dux on GitHub if you like. So we will start uh, with the syntax of conditional types and how we can build them. 
then we will see how we can debug those conditional types manually to check if our types are still correct. Uh, then we will uh, see how we can analyze nested objects and how we can produce very dynamic but very strictly typed APIs for uh, our applications. And if there is some time, we will also have a look at automated, automated testing, making sure that uh, our API really works as we expect it. <clears throat> and to introduce you to conditional types, I just prepared a little demo. I will just uh, share with you some insights uh, when you somehow screw up, when types not work anymore, and you come down to use uh, the any type. And uh, as you can see, the source code that we will see today, you can get everything from GitHub. Uh, there is an open source uh, uh, repository that you can use. So, okay. So what you can see here is a simple uppercase function. And it, just, it doesn't do much, but it's, it just is a demo to demonstrate what pitfalls we have in the all day life. Uh, when it comes to typing. Uh, when you see the uh, uh, signature of the method and the return type of the method, is there something that comes to your mind that we can improve right away? Sorry? The types. The types, beca yeah, because there are no types yet, right? There is the any type. And any are I said before, never use the any type, but I think this is not really, it, it, this doesn't really apply to our uh, project life. Sometimes we miss some information, sometimes we are not able to type everything, and then we just fall down to any type. The only thing that you need to know about the any type is that you are just back in JavaScript land. You, will, you won't have any uh, code completion, you won't have any compiler uh, errors if you do something wrong. So that's why uh, any is a little bit, uh, yeah, a different case in this time. So down below you see the usages of this method. So we can now see, okay, sometimes we want to pass a string, sometimes we pass null. And this we, we need to reflect this usage somehow in our type system. So, and we can do this by saying, all right, uh, this uppercase method it uh, takes a string as a parameter, and then we can introduce a union type by using the pipe uh, sign and saying, all right, we also want to have uh, this uh, null to be allowed here. And now you can see, hmm, the usage is below, two of them are working, but one is broken. And the problem is just that the string uh, that, that we now say, okay, this method can either return null or a string, and TypeScript is saying us, okay, you potentially receive a null value here, that's why you cannot call another method on it. Okay, fair enough, then we might want to introduce another uh, act, uh, function overload to it by saying export function, passing the name, and say text of type string and string. So this is really just another overload that we can uh, say to, or to, to define that when we have a string that we surely re return a string. Now we get the first version fixed, but the other two are broken. <laughs> so we can uh, try it once more. Now we have a problem with a null value. And okay, then we just say, oh, sorry. We want to allow null value as, as well by using a second overload. Now the first two versions are working and the third, if you really use a union type in this method, now this one is broken. And maybe half a year ago when I see something like this, I just gave up. <laughs> I introduced any again and then uh, the code was just working. <laughs> okay. But then I uh, read something about uh, Anders Heilsberg introducing uh, conditional types. And conditional types help us uh, to getting around those problems. And if you want to create a conditional type, it goes something like that, that you can declare a new type. Oh, sorry. 
And then you need to give this type a name. I say string or null. And then you pass this uh, type a generic parameter. And then now you can in, uh, instruct TypeScript to infer the right uh, type depending on what is passed. You can say, hey, TypeScript, please check if the parameter that I am giving you uh, extends string, for example. If yes, then return a string. Otherwise, return null. So this one-liner, as you can see, this is just a ternary expression, or a if-else when it comes to your type system. And we can use uh, this kind of logic to improve uh, the situation below here by saying, or by making this one overload generic and say, okay, we accept t and now return a string or null of t. So then we can rid of the, get rid of this overload and then um, we are fine. So and now you can see if a parameter of a certain type comes in this method, the conditional type checks if this type is of type string. If yes, it says, all right, I am now a string. Or if not, it says, okay, now I am a null value. And this helps us here in the usages below uh, really to uh, yeah, accept everything that we want to. And this is a really yeah, easy yeah, example to see what actually a conditional type is. Namely, it's just a ternary expression and it's a possibility to add some logic to our type system. So, um, when I started using a conditional types, it was a little bit hard for me to read it. That's why I printed it here on the slides. It's just telling TypeScript, okay, if T is of a certain type A, then return A, otherwise return another type. And you're totally free to return whatever you like in this case. Um, the, benefit, the benefit of such a conditional type is that you really can provide more clarity when it comes to your API. So you see that conditional type is not a feature of TypeScript that um, adds benefit to your application or project users, it adds benefit to your team because you really can print out what parameters are allowed and what the result um, of the API is. And that's why you can also provide a little bit more guidance to your developers and yeah, re refine how an API should be used. And in my opinion, type declarations also scale a little bit better. You have already seen that we, uh, uh, yeah, subs we are got rid of one type overload, so you do not need to um, maintain multiple static defined function overloads. One is enough and then you're fine. And yesterday, I saw a tweet on Twitter uh, from a colleague where he was asking the community, okay, what are you doing to protect your library from misuse? And he provided a few points that came into his mind, like writing a documentation, um, writing blog posts, or adding a linter rule if something uh, breaks. And what was missing for me is that you can yeah, direct the user of your API just by embracing the type system of your respective uh, programming language. And in TypeScript, we have something like that, like conditional types. Another thing that I added here below is, okay, oh, oh my presenter is not working, or no, it's not, um, uh, was at the second point that's also good to provide just understandable ex uh, ex uh, exception exception messages if you want to direct the user of your API to a certain point. And conditional types really add, uh, can, yeah, or really can solve some problems you have before if you recognize that your developers using your APIs are using it or are misusing it, you can just provide conditional types uh, by guiding them to a better, guiding them to use the better way. Um, what is really yeah, kind of a problem if you use conditional types, you really add logic to your type system. 
And if you are, if, if, yeah, since we are all human, we also can make mistakes, right? And so it's really possible to introduce bugs by writing conditional types. And that's why it's really, really um, critical to also test uh, everything that your type system works correctly. And that's why we will also see in the end of this talk how we can apply our, our automatic testing to check if our uh, types are still using uh, are still working correctly. Yeah. So, how can we test if a conditional type works as expected? Uh, we just need to fill in the gaps. So, a conditional type adds uh, at least one generic type parameter. And if, we, if you want to see the result of a certain conditional type, you can just pass in uh, yeah, some type you want, and then you can just uh, check in this. Oh, no, it was working just at least for a moment. <laughs> um, you can just check here if the type really is what you expect. So when you start with conditional types, this is the most easiest thing to, to make some progress there. Um, I prepared some uh, test cases or manual test cases for us. I will just command this in, so hopefully this is working, okay. And you already have seen that, uh, yeah, the, if we pass a string, that this is already working, right? You can see that the TypeScript compiler uh, infers the right value. For now, this is working as well. Uh, string on all is also working as well. And in the fourth example, I tried something different. I added a, you know, a type that was not really meant to be there. And this is a number type. So the number type is not really part of the implementation of the function uh, or part of the API. Uh, and I just added it to check what, what happens if there is uh, another, another type. And as you can see, TypeScript infers string or null. Um, this is not meant to be a mistake. We just did not handle uh, the number, uh, the number type it's, it itself. Because if we pass a number to the conditional type, um, the conditional type will infer the null value automatically. I just try to split the screen to make it more obvious. So, if we pass a number to the conditional type, then number becomes whoop, number becomes t. And then t, so this is the number, number does not extend string, and that's why uh, the conditional type infers null. So this is how you read the conditional type. And this sample really just should show you that you really need to be aware what you want to be the result of your, of your type system in this case. So basically, conditional types give you the full power of making everything with your parameters, with your results uh, that you want to, uh, as the little Lego Darth Vader tells you. So he has more authority than I have, I think. <laughs> so you have three ways um, working with conditional types. You can, at the one end, you can restrict types. So by adding type constraints, you really can say you only allow a certain amount of types. You can also omit unwanted types. You can tot completely delete them if you, uh, if you are certain that those types are somehow converted into valid types, for example. Or um, you can pass a responsibility completely to the user that you know, okay, I do not know how to handle this type but the developer uses this API just need to check uh, if the type he wanted uh, is valid or not. So this is a way how we restrict types, and this is nothing really new. Uh, you can use type constraints since uh, generics has been published for conditional types by uh, just adding, oh, now it's, Sorry, it's not really working. Um, by just saying, okay, T should extend a string or, or a null value. So this is type constraint uh, that you can use, for example. Um, what you also can do is you can omit unwanted types. So for example, you could say, if, 
it's neither a string nor a null, please return never. The never type is not that famous in TypeScript, but it's there since TypeScript exists. Uh, if you have an endless loop or an exception throwing, TypeScript uh, uh, says, okay, this is some kind of never type because the routine never uh, will return into the program flow. Um, what you see in the sample is that conditional types can nest it as many times as you want to. You can uh, make very, very deep checks of certain parameters and then just uh, give back the right uh, type that you want to. So here's just um, a sample. If you're not familiar with the never type, it really comes down. If you throw a new error or something like that, then TypeScript uh, automatically infers the never type. And instant, instead of never, since TypeScript 3.0, you can use a new type called the unknown type. And uh, this, uh, the sample is pretty much the same, and un the unknown type just uh, means uh, TypeScript. I do not have any idea what the shape of the object looks like. Um, so please make sure that I check every capability of the object before I really use it. So this is a very defensive strategy uh, to force the user of an API to check really against uh, the object if everything is present or not. So let's just see this in action. We will start by adding so by adding this type constraint. So we can just extend the sample oh, by saying string or null. And as you can see, when I use this constraint, then my TypeScript code throws an error because now I am forced to use this as well here to ensure that only valid values are allowed to, oh, to be passed to uh, the method. And if I now try to do something like this, uh, like passing a number, then this is completely not uh, possible anymore. Or if you s go to this sample, the manual debugging thing, now this code also uh, immediately blows up. So this is one possibility. Um, and we also can enhance this by just you are adding a new check so if oh sorry so if it's not a string we can also say all right if it's not a string then please check if it extends null Whoa. so if yes then return null otherwise you can uh, return never yeah, so this would be the possibility how to write this uh, with a nested conditional type. And if you're familiar to the prettier formatter, uh, so it's just a tool formatting your JavaScript or TypeScript code automatically, um, uh, prettier is aware of conditional types too and formats them accordingly to have a good reading experience. Um, if we do something like this. I just need to remove this types constraint for a moment to be able to to just show you the, res the outcome of the never type. So we now have applied never. And now you can see since number is not recognized anymore by the conditional type, uh, we receive the never type here and we are not able to work uh, with D any further. What we also can do is, using the new unknown type, which was introduced in TypeScript 3.0, and now since D is unknown, you will recognize that D has not any properties that we can work with, and that's why unknown really forces us to check what, um, really check if, yeah, which capabilities uh, D has, for example, and if you do this, then uh, TypeScript infers automatically all the methods uh, that are possible to, to be used. So this really comes down to your use case, how you want to, the, the developer to use your API. 
and you're totally free of do whatever yeah whatever you want to do mm, and i'm just here to to tell you what possibilities you have <clears throat> so you're maybe also familiar with this built-in human firewall so just to protect yourself to not get emotional attacked by someone else that's why you do not allow really everyone to look very deep in your darkest secrets and the same applied to javascript as well it wasn't really possible to predict everything what happens at runtime but with conditional types this firewall was removed uh, entirely because now we are really able to go deep into the object structure and to infer certain uh, types and infer uh, yeah, is the right keyword to describe this feature of conditional types as well. You can now uh, look into a certain uh, object and check if there is a property having a certain type. And you can just remember this type using the infer keyword and maybe return this type back to the user or to the developer using your API. And at a first glance, you may ask, okay, when do I want to use this feature? We will just see in a moment an example where this will be applied. But the basic message is that you now can use TypeScript objects uh, looking into the type system uh, and extract certain values if you need them uh, for some uh, yeah, converting things or transformations you do inside of your application code. And the infer key really, it is an enabler to build APIs, so dynamic APIs that yeah, behave differently based on the parameters you pass to certain methods or yeah, to certain methods. So let's see what the infer keyword actually is by just doing this. So. Um, what you can see here, or what we now want to, to analyze, is a distilled uh, version of what NGRX DUX is. So the, the version or the, yeah, the idea of NGRX DUX uh, fits into 16 lines of code. And uh, you will now see where I was forced to use conditional types to make my uh, yeah, library running. What we have here first is just a little interface. It is a, it's just a helper for us. It's a, uh, yeah, it takes uh, yeah, an option and has a property, maybe a property payload, and payload can have nearly every shape. So it can be anything, at least. And then I have a conditional type, and I named this conditional type command, and this takes also a generic parameter. And now I look into the, yeah, into T, into the generic property or into the parameter. And now I have a look at, okay, if you find in a payload property inside of this uh, object, then provide a method with a parameter that returns nothing to the user. If there is no payload inside of this object, then just return a plain method doing nothing. So what I'm now able to do is that I can have a look inside of the parameter and based on the parameter, I can provide a strictly typed method to the developer using my API. And here you can see the, uh, yeah, a method, it's just a, a factory method. You can see it's just a fake implementation. I really only care about the type uh, information here. That's why we can just uh, yeah, collapse this. And now you can see that I say, okay, T must extend command option. Uh, so I restrict that this factory only can get uh, yeah, a command option type. And then I return a command of T. And in the usage, you can say the following. So if there is uh, an object passed with a payload and a string, then the method, sorry, the method infers to be 
yeah, a method having a payload with a string. And if I do any, something like this, okay, this cannot work because it's not the type, but if I remove this property, you can immediately see that my TypeScript code breaks. Because if I have not a, yeah, a payload property ready, then this method is inferred to be a plain method. And that then I just need to adjust my code accordingly, otherwise I cannot proceed. So what, I, what you have seen here, maybe I just uh, give you another example. We can also say payload is not of type string anymore, now it's of type number. Now TypeScript also complains, say string is not allowed anymore, you need to have a number. Oh, sorry. Uh, maybe. Oh, no, it's, it, it's correct, sorry. So uh, now you have to pass uh, a number to my, uh, yeah, to my method. So, and what you see here is that TypeScript now embraces the open-close principle of software development right in the type system. So if you change something, you will immediately get feedback at development time, not just on, uh, on runtime. Uh, that you need to change something. So your system is really close to, chain, uh, to, to, to changes, but you can apply and add, and add new, new versions to, to your API. And this is what I really like about uh, conditional types. <clears throat> um, do you now know what a conditional type actually is? Uh, it's just a ternary expression, and TypeScript itself uh, provides some helpers to you uh, that, yeah, that you can use to uh, play a little bit around with your type system. Uh, what I think is really uh, neat is, uh, for example, the non-nullable type. So if you have a, a property accepting null or a, an actual value, you can wrap this value inside non-nullable, and non-nullable will extract all the optional and null types from your type. Um, you can also infer automatically the return types of some methods if you want to, or can just uh, extract uh, the constructor parameters of a certain class if you need to. So these are all helpers that are already, all, yeah, already ready for you, and you do not need to um, uh, write them on your own. For example, the first two ones here, like exclude and extract, are based on the idea using the never type uh, in your conditional type, where you can omit uh, certain types. So what we have learned so far is how we can, uh, what a conditional type is and what we, how we can use it and especially what the infer keyword is. For me, infer is the most powerful uh, feature of conditional types, but what we have not seen yet is uh, how we can test this automatically. Um, you can imagine if you are a library uh, developer and you produce multiple versions of your library and you change something in the core, you always need to make sure that you do not break someone else using your library. And at a certain uh, size of your library, you cannot uh, have a look at everything, and that's why it's a good idea to add automated tests to it. And the way that you can apply those tests is by using a tool called uh, TS Snippet. Is someone here that already uses TS Snippet? Okay, then I can uh, tell you something new. <laughs> So TS Snippet uh, is hosted on NPM and uh, it's just a runner for your TypeScript compiler and you can just use it in your unit tests. So you can uh, prepare a simple TypeScript code inside of your, uh, uh, of your unit test that you want to run. In this case, I want to check my uppercase method and the uppercase method uh, yeah, just runs against some code that I provide inside of my test. As a second parameter, you can also specify some TypeScript compiler options, and I just added the strict value because I like the strict mode. <clears throat> and in the actual test, you can see uh, that I really just write the TypeScript code that I want to check, 
And the first thing is that I want to make sure that I that this code compiles. And that's why a snippet allows you to use a metric called uh, to succeed. And if the TypeScript code would not compile, you would uh, this unit test would fail. And I recommend you if you want to use TS snippet in your in your project, uh, always write a test with to succeed because it really provides you a lot of detailed error information. What really fails? If you use other method uh, uh, measures of expect snippet, uh, you just get a red bulb and it just blows up, but you do not know what really went wrong. And that's why I always uh, double check this with the to succeed measure. So here is now the in most interesting part, I think, of TS snippet. You can, uh, again, write the TypeScript code. In this case, I just uh, provide uh, a null value, and uh, I just want to check that union types work with my API. And then I uh, store the, the result of this uh, method in my result property. And there is another metric called to infer in TS snippet, where I really can check, okay, has result the value or the type that I expect. And this is really a cool thing to have uh, type safety and type safety checked by your uh, unit tests automatically. And there is also another test, just um, checking that zero as or numbers that they are not allowed to be used with my API. And here I just expect that the code fails. Every time when I show unit tests, I have the wish to show that they are green. And that's why we just check if they are running. I assume that they are fail now. OK, this is correct. <laughs> um, and this is just because um, here, one test fails because it says, OK, it should not allow numbers, but somehow numbers seems to be allowed in my code right now. And the reason for this is that I removed the types constraint here before, and now I just can use uh, numbers with my API. And this is a potential misuse. So if I re-add my type constraint here, so, So now I just want to rerun my test. Yeah. Okay. I am done. <laughs> so since the test is green, uh, I am happy. <laughs> wow. So precise. So precise. All right. So guys, if you enjoyed the talk, just make some noise, please. Thank you, thank you. All right, so now we are going to switch to a Q&A session, right? And we've got a special gift from Godel Technologies uh, for, for the guy who is gonna ask the best question. And Gregon is gonna decide who. So be brave and do your best in order to to get the price, okay? So this is it, all right? Uh -huh. okay. And then I am gonna tell what is the price about. Da mm Soha, -hmm. yes. So please ask in English. If you don't know English, if you don't know how to speak English, we'll ask you to ask you. Okay, so I'll try. Uh, thanks for your great talk, mm -hmm. it was awesome. I have two questions. Uh, mm -hmm. First might look um, simple. What is the difference between any type and uh, unknown? Mm. And the second question is, uh, I want you to open your VS Code. Mm -hmm. uh, can you open, please? Mm -hmm. uh, first, yes. So uh, throughout the whole uh, presentation, we saw that uh, conditional types mainly used with extends keyword. Mm -hmm. is, uh, is it possible to use some other keywords, for example, uh, key off or something else? Um, yeah. So this should be possible. So you, you need to, I start with the last question. So is, if it, is it possible to use other keywords? Yes, it is possible. So you can compose them. You can use, uh, you must use extents, of course. But uh, what you do here, you can nearly do everything. You can say, okay, it's just key of type of something. And 
uh, this will work, of course. Yeah, that's possible. And your first question, sorry, what was your first any question? Any versus... Uh, any versus unknown, okay. Yeah, so unknown is a counterpart to any, so any allows you to do anything with a type, right? And unknown just says you can do nothing with a type, unless you uh, make sure that uh, certain properties exist. And therefore, you must use... Oh, I have deleted it previously, sorry. So when you have something like this instance of... I, I think it was object, right? If you write code like this, this is considered in TypeScript to be a type guard. And if you add a type guard to your code and TypeScript sees this, now TypeScript is sure, okay, when it's of type object, I know that this type must have uh, the, all the methods that our object has. So unknown is really a very, is a safer way uh, than any. Yeah. Okay. If you want to use unknown in, in a library or something like this, um, you just need to be a little bit careful if you have users using uh, TypeScript versions before 3.0. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> so thank you. And um, I also have two questions. First is simple. Um, mm -hmm. I saw somewhere article about conditional types and some guy did some very crazy stuff. He tried to uh, write types for current functions. He used a lot of mm -hmm. magic, <laughs> yeah. let's say it. And uh, he used, he even implemented like uh, in increment operation on the type Mm -hmm. And uh, so the first question, uh, uh, what about performance? Uh, uh, what, yes, can we use uh, a lot of these conditional types or it will slow our development? Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, the second question is about um, uh, your uh, last slides. When you wrote uh, automated tests, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you used uh, simple types like string and null, and mm -hmm. uh, what about interfaces? Because they mm -hmm. exist only on a compile time. Uh, will it work or not? Mm -hmm. so. Okay, so to the first questions, I have not recognized any performance issues. As a, um, if it would be a performance issue, I would only have recognized it when the compile time uh, is, is bigger than before. For me, it was not. So, but I have no proof for it. It's just my, my own uh, feeling, how I interacted with it until yet. And the second thing, yes, of course, it will work with interfaces as well. So TS snippet really runs internally a TSC uh, against this code snippet, and uh, you can uh, use this against interfaces as well. The only thing that happens uh, as if you have more complicated types, uh, it could be that uh, this here uh, becomes very large. Sometimes you have interface of person with gold customer and contact and so on, and you really need to match exactly this type string. So some, sometimes it becomes a little bit hard to read. Yeah, but it's possible, yeah. It's also, uh, you can also, sorry, <laughs> uh, you can also have a look at it at uh, the NGRX Stux repository because I wrote uh, tests with T snippet uh, for my types there with interfaces. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, can you open uh, hypercase TS and scroll to the top? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, you have. Um, uh, a nested ternary operator here, uh, it's uh, considered a, a bad practice. Uh, why don't you use um, a, a nested conditional type instead of uh, mm, nested mm -hmm. ternary operator? Oh, this is also a good question. Um, I think here it also come. this question is a little bit about uh, readability and maintainability. You're completely right. Um, you can simplify this by uh, just using yet another conditional type for it. And here in this demo, I just wanted to show you that it's technically possible. And in a, a real project like the NGRX Stux library, I sl slowly try to figure out what is the best way. 
Sometimes uh, it's a good idea to use or just extract another conditional type, but then you sometimes lose flexibility and then you end up producing more and more and more interfaces and then you have something I call interface micromanagement. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I have no real golden way for this, uh, but I think I get better and better as more I use the conditional types. But yeah, it's completely right. You can uh, just improve readability by extracting useful and meaningful other interface names. Mm -hmm. Perfect, guys. Any more questions? One more. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Uh, hi, Gregor. Thank you for your talk. That was great. Actually, since we have no uh, complicated questions, I have uh, one about yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, was it too difficult and uh, how long did it take for you to become a Google expert? Mm, okay, That's, I have a whole presentation about this topic actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so everything, so to make this short for me, it took nearly a year to become a GDE. So I make the decision that this would be, so this, this is what I really want to be, and this is, was a goal because I just wanted to reach out to as many developers as possible to help them to write good Angular applications. And then I started uh, the application process. For the application process, you need a recommendation by a, a Googler or another GDE, so this was the first step. And then you go through several interview processes and until everything was done, it was nearly a year, I think. It was a bit, no, it was a bit more than a year. I started with it in April, and uh, this year in May, I ac actually become a GD. Yeah, and how it feels like <laughs> to be a you're, Google expert. Yeah, so, so you're still a human. <laughs> um, what really is nice uh, about this is to have the opportunity to uh, get support by Google. Uh, without Google, I wouldn't be here because they paid for the flight and for uh, the hotel here. Uh, this is one benefit that you have. And actually how it feels, I get more and more frightened <laughs> because now you have uh, yeah you have a lot of responsibility to empower the community and you really do not want to say something wrong to to someone else. Ah, really? So you really make sure okay is it really right is it uh, does this uh, answer applies to that what your uh, your community fellow uh, really wants. So I will. So I am more, or I become more careful in in saying something to others. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> That's another question. One more. Thank you. Um, uh, when I when you first time showed an example of conditional type, mm -hmm. after that moment during the whole presentation, I have I have uh, the feeling that. Uh, this thing uh, will not the, make my, my applications more stricted and more uh, safe because mm -hmm. it's from my point of view this is kind of idiomatic mistake. Instead of introducing conditional types, we had introduced two different functions. Because, mm -hmm. for example, if your function, like this mm -hmm. example, if your function returns string or null, then probably the caller of this function will get the null pointer exception if, if you will not the add additional checks. So mm -hmm. this kind of Missed from my point of view. Maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Please correct me. No, you're totally right. Actually, so I, I see your point. Um, uh, when I first read about conditional types, I read through the article and I just said, okay, now I can use ternary expressions. Why? And uh, a lot of things come really down um, to think that you cannot control. So this example really, you would not even write code like that in, in your project. Um, maybe another good example for using conditional types is something uh, things get out of your control. There was, for example, an update in NGRX, in the NGRX library from 7 to 8, and they introduced a whole new type system. And I helped a customer migrating their uh, old uh, version of NGRX to the new one. But in the new one, you have not the possibility to use uh, these action types from NGRX 7. 
And therefore, I was forced to write a conditional type to allow them to seamlessly uh, uh, migrate to NGX8. And this was a point where I said, ah, OK, now it makes totally sense to me. So it's kind of the um, handful uh, thing to, for migration, because it's, it seems like a dirty mm -hmm. hack, actually. Yeah. yeah, so for me, real one use case, and I, I wasn't aware of that, that conditional types helped me with uh, migrating code. But this was actually a good thing, to build a type facet, for example. Okay. And another use case, and this is just a little bit too hard to wrap this in a 30 minutes talk. Um, uh, if you know Redux and how dynamic Redux is and how hard it is to type Redux, there's also a very good tool to have conditional types ready using just conditional types to have control about the dynamic world in Redux. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Because actually, even this example looks mm -hmm. kind of ad hoc, and I, I suspect that people will make more crazy things, mm -hmm. and it will uh, definitely will not uh, the, make the code readable. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, the one more question: uh, you to, Is it possible to write not? Uh, is it possible to write conditional types w not using the um, terminal operator or some some you know? If, Unfortunately, if else, not, no, not yet. No, yeah? So I'm not aware of other uh, syntax versions of it. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, guys, last chance for the question. If not, I'm going to ask mine. So one more ex extension to the personal question we heard before. So I was wondering, mm -hmm. so you are CTO, from, uh, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what, is your, what is the name of your company? Co-IT. Co-IT, mm -hmm. that's right. How many guys are working for you? Uh, just 12. With you? 12, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. 12, okay? <laughs> just 12 guys. Yeah. So how come you continue developing and uh, ruling all this stuff <laughs> altogether? Uh, that's a good question. So I, if it is uh, hard for you or not to combine all these activities? No, it's, it's not that hard, really. So, uh, so most of the time I'm really a developer. I'm full-time uh, for my customers. I'm working for my customers full-time, eight hours a day. And, but I really have fun uh, building out uh, what we want to achieve with CoIT. We have the vision to build a place for developers where we can empower everyone to uh, exceed his or her limits. And because you have just fun organizing such stuff, I just took the role. So this is basically it. And then I really enjoy to uh, yeah, sparring with our CEO, with Uli, uh, in our Skype sessions. And then we just uh, come up with ideas what we can do next. And yeah, it's just fun. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Lucky you. Yeah. Uh, but I. I'm for sure I'm not the best CTO of the world. It's just the role, right? <laughs> so okay. we just do our best. <laughs> yeah, second one. Yeah, <laughs> Who is the best one. Uh, Elon Musk. Yeah, for, ex for example. For yeah. <laughs> example. All right, guys. Yeah. Thank you, Gregor. For okay. yes, you wanted to say something. No, no. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's wrap it up. And uh, now it's time to choose the best question. Mm -hmm. So firstly, thank you that no one asked, can you please took off this hat? <laughs> <laughs> I nearly forgot about this. <laughs> um, okay. I know it, yeah, it's always a little bit unfair because the last question is that would last uh, the most of the time, but I really think the last question was really the best uh, to ask when it really comes to conditional types. Uh, and what are really use cases for conditional types? That's why I would pass the prize to the last question. All right. <laughs> so this is yours, Ivan. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just come to this stage. What's your name? Evgeny. Ah, Evgeny. Okay. So that's it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is yes. This is just a course of Angular 8, but this is going to be updated very soon by our Russian guy, whose name is uh, Vladilian Minin. Uh, I totally recommend because I did it. Uh, it summarizes all your knowledge and you can dive in with this quickly. So just keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, guys, uh, we're going to have a pause of 10 minutes uh, in order to eat some pizza, do networking, just take your time to let each uh, other know. Uh, 
We also want uh, to do a group activity now. If you don't mind, all together we go close to the pine tree and make a photo of, uh, of the guys who came to, uh, to this meetup, uh, together with Gregor and all, uh, all the organizers. And then uh, I encourage you to take part, uh, part in uh, our lottery. Uh, that is aquarium uh, standing in, uh, in the reception in order to be uh, to, to, ah, to how to say in English uh, to try your luck with the, with the numbers, okay? With the, all this cosmo energy and so on. So let's move to the pine tree. Thank you. <laughs> 